Please pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I always love it when the gospel story is like murders and darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth, and then I'm like, the gospel of the Lord, right? It doesn't seem like good news, does it? Um, And we're going to talk a little bit about that gospel message, but today um, I want to talk a little bit more about our New Testament reading from Philippians. And this isn't because I don't want to preach on such a negative passage, (laughs) although, yay, I don't have to preach on the negative passage, but my very favorite, one of my very favorite passages is Philippians 4, verses 1 through 9, specifically 4 through 9. Um, a lot of you know that when um, people, at, uh, when I'm finished preaching, I'm always like, oh, this is one of my favorite passages. Um, and I say that all the time, so I don't know. I guess I like scripture. But when people ask me, and it really comes down to it, and they say, what is your favorite verse? This is one of my top three. This is one that I will name almost regularly. So I'm excited to talk a little bit about it this morning. Paul begins this fourth chapter to the Philippians with an encouragement to a colleague named Sitsigis, and he is encouraging that colleague to help the women that are leading the church in Philippi. It's been a struggle, and so he's encouraging them to work together as a group to share and spread the gospel message. And so he begins this, uh, this passage with one of the most encouraging pep talks I've ever heard that you can read in the New Testament. As an athlete, I picture this as one of those moments where you're in the locker room, right? And the anticipation, and you're going to go out there, and you're going to get the job done. And as a culture, we often listen to uh, pep talks in the locker room. You know, during halftime, we want to hear what the coach is saying to get the team revved up again. Or we celebrate them in feel-good sports movies. How many sports movies have you seen with a good ending where we didn't hear that very famous uh, pep talk in the middle, getting everybody ready to go out and face the challenge? And we even embrace a few historical pep talks, such as the one Herb Brooks shared with a 1980 U.S. hockey team as they went out to beat Russia, which has been the best hockey team in the world for decades. That might have gone a little something like this. Great moments are born from great opportunity. And that's what you have here tonight, boys. That's what you've earned here tonight. One game. If we played them ten times, they might win nine. But not this game. Not tonight. Tonight, we skate with them. Tonight, we stay with them. And we shut them down because we can. Tonight, we are the greatest hockey team in the world. You were born to be hockey players, every one of you, and you were meant to be here tonight. This is your time. Their time is done. It's over. I'm sick and tired of hearing about what a great hockey team the Soviets have. Forget them. This is your time. Now go out there and take it. I might have seen the movie a few too many times. Miracle, if you haven't seen it, it's a great, great movie. But that is Herb Brooks's pep talk to this team, and they go out and they win because they're so inspired. So as a person, a person of faith and as a pastoral coach of sorts, I want to start out today by listening again to these words of Paul in Philippians. And I'm going to invite you to sit back, maybe take a pencil or a pen and take some notes on a piece of paper, Um, or make a few mental notes about the words and the phrases that particularly stand out to you as we go through this greatest of pep talks in the New Testament. So just take a minute to listen and hear the words that stand out to you and hold on to those, okay? So from Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, 
whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, and if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Good job. <laughs> oh, that brings me such hope, too. <laughs> Every time I read this passage, it brings me um, hope and a new purpose. And it reminds me that we all have such opportunity um, to share good news and that we already have exactly what it takes to do that. That there's so many good things to think on and to share with people. And so we can share that gospel in a meaningful way. And so I wonder, what does this passage make you want to do? Because these words aren't just feel-good words that we hear and then walk away smiling, right? It's just like any other pep talk. My job is to give you the pep talk, and then you walk out of here and go do something. They're words that are written to inspire the community to work together. So we come together as the gathered church, but then we also go out as the scattered church to share the gospel in word and deed. Too many times, though, I think we hear these words and we get revved up, but then we wonder, what do these words really mean? What am I really called to do? So I want to take a minute and have you turn to someone sitting next to you, and I want you to share the word that stuck out to you, and I want you to talk about what those words actually mean. What would it mean for you to take that word or that phrase and do something with it. And if you're online, I invite you to share that with someone else or start a text conversation, um, but reach out to someone and let's talk about what these words and this passage means for us. What are we meant to go out and do? So now it's your turn to talk to each other. Which means talk. Well, y'all are much more talkative than early service. I think they were still asleep this morning. <laughs> I hate to interrupt your conversations, but hopefully it's a conversation that you'll continue when you leave church today. And again, while this passage is something that I underline or share out loud when people ask me what my favorite Bible verse is, there are two things that I'm drawn to share today because this is a very hopeful passage, in my opinion. The first thing I want to share is that near the beginning of 4 through 9, Paul instructs the, Phil the Philippians, do not worry about anything, but in prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, or let your requests to God be made known. So on the one hand, when I read the words, do not worry, I think to myself, okay, don't worry. <laughs> there's a reason there's a knot in this shoulder, right? That's a lot easier said than done. Um, it feels a little flippant to say that to someone, doesn't it? Because we do worry, and there are hard things going on, and it's hard to just go, all right, I won't worry. But there is a depth of meaning that I think Paul is uh, in intending for these words. And here's the thing. He's writing these words from prison. 
He's writing this pep talk of hope and, and goodness while he sits in prison. And so he's still instructing the people, even in this hard time for himself, to rejoice in all things. So what's behind his ability to not worry? And I think that is faith. Um, my friend Phil, Phil Reggie Jones, who's a colleague of mine at Texas Lutheran, um, translates the word courage as, I mean, uh, faith as courageous trust. And this past week, I learned that the word courage comes from two roots, meaning with and heart. So with all your heart or wholeheartedly. So when you have courage, you do something wholeheartedly without fear. Courage doesn't mean you're going to not think on the hard things or what needs to be done or that you're going to sit back and wait for a lightning bolt to just come down and fix everything, right? But courage means letting down your guard and being vulnerable and sharing God's love even in the face of difficult things and being able to do so joyfully because our trust in God's love and mercy is greater than whatever hardships we face. Do not worry, says God. I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I know that you are with me, and I know that whatever the outcome is, you are by my side. Do not worry, says God. Please help me with this struggle because I'm so grateful and thankful that I can turn to you for strength and guidance, and I rejoice that you listen and hear me. Do not worry, says be still and know that I am God. The second thing that stands out to me is this, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, rejoice. This is, I love it how Paul is just emphasizing, rejoice in the Lord always. Hey, by the way, in case you missed it the first time, again, I say rejoice. It's that important. For me, this is what I can glean from this challenging gospel text today in Matthew. There are many scholars who disagree on whether this is allegorical or metaphorical or whether there's a deeper meaning that we don't really get and we have to really dig to uncover it. But one thing that I can't argue is that the king's friends were called to celebrate and rejoice, and they didn't bother. They didn't come. They didn't think it was necessary to stop what they were doing and rejoice on a joyous occasion. In fact, they even got a little bit malicious about it. Sometimes I think I feel a little malicious when somebody wants me to be in their joy and I'm not feeling it. And when the whole marketplace or the city was invited, they did, but there was one who came, and he came half-heartedly. He didn't put on the traditional robe. He just came and sat. Maybe he just came for the food, but he definitely wasn't there to celebrate fully. Paul says, in whatever circumstance, and for him right now, it's jail, we can and we should still rejoice, always. It's a hard way to live, but there is a place for both things. It's like the Children's Bereavement Center, when we heard this morning about them meeting to talk about family members or loved ones who've committed suicide, and yet at the dinner there was talking and laughing and mingling with people and celebrating life in a meal, even though they were going to go talk about something hard later. It's about having that bad day, but still wanting to be thankful for everything that you have. Or when someone close to you dies, but you're glad for an end to their suffering. Or when you have a great day, but you come home to listen to your child share an excruciating story of pain or struggle from their own day, and you want to be there for them, but you also want to hang on to your own joy for that good thing that happened, and you find yourself in both places. And that's the thing, right? Sorrow and pain and anger and sadness coexist with joy all the time. We aren't called to forget the bad things or to dismiss them, not at all. But we are called to this hope that this pep talk in Philippians gives us. We are called to get back up and to read these words and to think on the good things and get back out there and face adversity. There seems to be a lot going on in our world today that's hard. So maybe these words are especially important for us this week. Rejoicing is always a complicated thing, 
And courageous trust is a challenge in a world full of worry. But today, I hope you take home the words of Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9, and I hope you write them down or post them in your house somewhere, or record them to listen to sometime during the week when you need to be picked up, because God's love is in all circumstances. Everything worthy of praise is still alive and well, even in the midst of trouble because of Jesus Christ. So rejoice in the Lord always, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen.